I didn't create content out of the want to gain a following. It was just a way of practicing storytelling. And I remember, I think the first one got 300 views. And then I think the next one got 7,000 views. There was one a few after that that got like 500,000 views. And I was honestly on the floor in shock. I was terrified. So one of my favorite phrases is, it's not you versus me, it's you and me versus the problem. And I feel like within myself, there are often two voices. One who's like, you can do this, you can do this. And the other one's like, no, you can't. And I've managed to kind of align them. How do I work with myself? and try and get myself into a good place to like, deal with this problem rather than bashing myself. I was hurting a lot inside and I would come out really in very negative ways. Okay. I was kind of impacting people around me and it took a few people to sit me down and be like, you're being really negative and I don't want someone like this in my life. It's really sad when you lose people in your life because of your own actions. That's when you really have to sit down and be like, no, I can't do this again. I can't afford to you know, news lovely people in my life because of me, because of my issues. Georgiana, I am so happy to have you here. You have created a sensational TikTok account all around London travel-based content. So I think a great place to start would be for people to understand a little bit more about what drew you to the content world. It was January 2021 and we'd just been thrown into the third lockdown. I was working TV, I was working in development and I was feeling, I think, creatively quite frustrated. You know, when you're quite low down on the ladder in TV, you don't get a lot of editorial decisions. You don't get control of the program. I got really obsessed with the, the For You page, I, yeah. as everyone does. And it was just so interesting. I thought, I can do this. I can, you know, create short little videos. I can practice my editing. I can practice my filming. I can practice my storytelling. Um, and so what I did was, it, I didn't sort of create content out of the want to gain a following. It was just a way of practicing storytelling. Yeah. So I just got on my bike and cycled around London and just took little snapshots of London, you know. So for example, like around, there's a like really beautiful part in Chelsea where there are like these huge mansions. You know, one of the, the sort of the entrances, there's, there are two doorbells and one says, you know, here's a doorbell for visitors and here's a doorbell for servants. I was like, wow, that's, that's really unusual. And also, uh, you know, maybe other people haven't seen this. I, yeah. I'll take a little video and I like, put it into like a kind of compilation of what became then things in London that just make sense. Yeah, and I love, I love that strand video on our channel. I, know. I think I binge watch all of them. It was, it was so fun to make, but it starts off just, you know, seeing like a, the, oh, it's one of the bridges in the West London. It's like, it's got golden details. I was like, that's not normal. Not every bridge has this. Or there's like an ornate, you know, water fountain that is like the size of, I think it's like the size of this room. And it's just stupidly big. I was like, that's also not normal. But because I live in London, I just cycle past this every day without noticing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think over the last few years, I've really taken a great deal of care to notice the small things or notice things that are interesting. You know, when I'm walking down the street, I'll look up at the buildings. I'm like, what, you know, what can I see there? What do people not notice when they're, you know, walking and just their arm and it's, you know, straight or yeah. on the floor? Um, and so I just started connecting and gathering all these bits and pieces and just threw them together into a series. And I remember, I think the first one got 300 views and I was like, oh, oh my God, I'm famous. I made it. I was thinking on Instagram at the time, I'd get maybe like 20 likes and they were from my friends. I was also, I was like, well, I don't really want any views, but this is exciting that 300 people have seen this. And then I just continued making this series because I just love the creative process. I love filming. I love putting it together, putting it to music. And then I think the next one got 7,000 views. And I was honestly on the floor in shock. I was terrified. I was like, oh, people have discovered my account. This was supposed to be something just for me, just yeah. you know, to, for me to practice making things. And I think it just kind of escalated from there. Like the next few, I think there was one a few after that that got like 500,000 views. At that point, I was really scared because it just felt like it was just too much. And, you know, suddenly my followers grew to 10,000 followers. I was like, oh, God. Like, but at this time, I didn't have, I didn't have, like, any kind of, my face wasn't on there. My name was HRH Queen GLD, GLD because I didn't want anyone knowing who I was. Yeah, I didn't have a proper voiceover. I just had the automatic TikTok hand voice. It was really anonymous because I was terrified of anyone I knew finding out. Yes. And... Yeah, I think then at some point a friend was like, use your own voice, you have quite a nice voice. And I did, and then I get an echo and it's being like, I'm like your voice, continue you know, using your voice. Yeah. And it just kind of spiraled from there and I just continued making content. Well, I think it's a challenge to put yourself out there as well. So what was that point when you got that confidence to start putting yourself in front of the camera? There was a part of me that was like, well, maybe I could, I could push it maybe a bit further and you never know what opportunities come from it 
if you then kind of become the face of a brand. You touched on briefly about how you were managing a TV career at the same time. I think a lot of people probably don't know that about you. Why are you not getting that creative outlet in working in TV at the time? I started off as an intern. Yeah. I was a researcher about stage, but as a researcher, you just don't have the creative control that a director does. Yeah. And so it's a lot of supporting a program or supporting the development and doing really important, but sort of not very creative tasks. Mm -hmm. Often I've like the low level, you just, you're not needed to, you know, make editorial decisions because it's not your role. And whilst there's, you know, part of me that was like, I could be a director now. I know it's really important to learn all the little things that lead, you know, that kind of, you can build on, um, that will make me a very good director in the future. But also it was lockdown as well. I'm sure if, if, I, if it hadn't been lockdown, down, probably wouldn't just felt that way. Um, it felt like a lot of it was out of my control mm -hmm. and it just was a way of me channeling something and being able to control something. Definitely. And I think that's a really good point. You mentioned that obviously when you are starting out, you are doing all the preliminary stuff before you get to that stage. So if you are somebody who's really raring to go and, and wants to create things, it's nice now that you have places like TikTok and Instagram to be able to do that. Definitely. I feel like I'm very pushy. You know, like I've become... I started off my career so worried and so nervous and huge imposter syndrome like I didn't deserve this I can't do this career I've always wanted to work in TV and I'm so nervous and oh god it's terrifying what if I do something wrong and I'm fired and I'll you know be blacklisted from the entire industry now I've kind of got to a place where I'm like I'll you know email my managing director like can I sit down I want to have a 10 minute chat with you about my career how I'm doing how do I get an XYZ place I want to shoot when can I do it and I'll do that with my director as well, with my producer. Or I'll be like, I want to shoot. Let me shoot. I'll do anything to like gain that experience. That's great. And I think the only bad downside of that is that sometimes I don't know when to not push. <laughs> and so I'll just in, in opportune moments be like, can I film? And everyone's like, shut out. <laughs> that, that, that really important piece to think about. And so I do need to take a step back. Well, that sounds like a little bit of a journey there itself. So if you felt originally the opposite, yeah, well, imposter syndrome. What do you think happened that made you feel more confident to ask for those types of opportunities? I think what happened was I was so nervous at the beginning of my career that I would, I literally did anything. There was one time where I think they had some kind of pitch the next day and I stayed till 11 30. I mean, you know, obviously if you're a buying for a lawyer, that's kind of like normal. But in TV, it tends not to be like, especially if you're working in development. Um, but I was just like, I'm a team player. I'm going to, you know, do my all to to stay in this industry because initially I had a one month contract and I was like, at the end of this month, I might have to, at the time I was living in Berlin and I literally came over to London to try and create a career. And I was like, if this doesn't go right, I have to go back over to Berlin. I'm like, I'll find a horrible job that I really hate. Um, and I think what I did, and I tell my friends all the time to do this, is every time I got a piece of praise or like, you know, an email saying brilliant work, well done, I'd screenshot it and I would add it to a folder on my phone. And every time I had doubts, I would read them and be like, no, you can't have these thoughts because all of these people in the company have given you this praise and they're telling you you're doing a good job. Why are you telling yourself you're not doing a good job if everyone around you is telling you that you are doing it? I think now I have like 150 screenshots and if I don't have that, self-doubt anymore because I know they're there I know that I do a good job you've definitely leveraged your TikTok when it comes to working with brands can you tell us a bit about how you got into that space and then what was your first brand deal it was again 2021 must be when we were coming out of the lockdown and I, I'd set up I set up a Gmail account um and added it to my bio just in hopes that someone might send me an email and be like hey do you want to collaborate yourself and I think the first one I did was with Love Juice okay and I, it wasn't really like a brand deal they they I think they sent me like a gift card to go and buy one of their juices I was so thrilled I was like so excited I was like this is so exciting um and I just went and sort of did that you know shot a little video and it was really fun and from there I think that's when restaurants also started reaching out and saying hey do you want to eat for free and that's when I had to start telling my friends about it because I couldn't go and eat by myself from there then other brands reached out like Sean Lewis and Netflix and Canary Wolf and it just felt just insane yeah 
but also it's not it's not like tfl reaches out it's a lovely person from a pr agency that works with them so it doesn't feel as intimidating how do you know what opportunities to say yes to and which ones not to i used to be really like hardcore about it and if it wasn't like luxury or unique or secret i wouldn't do it now i think would my audience like to see this is this a brand with a good reputation mm-hmm. um you know there have been some companies that have reached out and invited me places in exchange for making content and i've been like no you've been in the news for really bad you know star writers you don't respect your staff you don't pay them a good wage i'm not going to be working with you sorry try and be quite good about that and i think now it's just if it's if it's a big brand they get quite excited but also you know sometimes you have to turn them down if they don't align with you if jim shard were like hey we want to work for you i'd be like no because i do do gym stuff yeah 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 um so it's just is is this a lie on top of my brand can this be london content focused and will it benefit people yeah and when it comes to leveraging tiktok in other areas so even in your career have you found that that helps at all i don't think so i feel like it's been a bit of a hindrance in a way i've told people that i work with about it and that you know it's really exciting they're like wow we did not expect this and i'm like same but the the problem is you get invited to so many things yeah. and that I really want to go to, but I might just not be in London. So I, I or I will have to really push to have a day off to do these TikTok things. And then it might be in the middle of like a filming schedule. And because I'm also not high up, I can't really push for that. So it means I have to miss out on a lot of opportunities. But if you're working already in TV and that's all month based base and you're, you're technically creating like small little docs yeah. anyway and... For those who don't know, you work in documentaries, don't you? That there could be some sort of crossover. Yeah, I think the way that you film TikTok is so different to documentaries. I like, I really love watching my, you know, my producers and my directors filming because then I can learn, you know, how do you frame something? Also, because it's horizontal versus vertical, it's very different. Yeah. Um, And there's a lot of, you know, dirty shots where, you know, you'll have something in the foreground that's out of focus. And then you'll have someone in focus in the background and then something exciting going on. And it just feels like there's a lot of that depth. Background. Yeah, yeah, actually. <laughs> it feels like there's a lot of depth and it's really, it just it looks beautiful and creamy and just delicious. But in TikTok, I feel like it has to be quite bright and to the point and not yeah. mysterious. You're so right, actually, because even with TikTok, there's also a tension span, isn't there? Yeah. So whether that's done through quick editing, I found anyway, or having to hook people in mm-hmm. straight away getting right to the point mm-hmm. whereas with docs a longer form content you can build up the story yeah i do lots of like here's a shot of a mountain and the beach and here's a seagull flying over you know a house yeah um or an empty street or like a ball rolling down hill or something yeah yes yeah. with tiktok you'd be like no. yeah you can't yeah you could not put that on tiktok people yeah like, no, next video i don't even know what the attention span is but i remember when i started it was like three seconds yeah if you can't put some with the first three seconds you might as well have made the video it feels like that sometimes do you have to really front load the information yeah i put out a question and i had an answer back from a listener mm-hmm. so let's get into it this is from ellie i've been thinking of starting my own tiktok and instagram for a while but i've struggled to come up with ideas on how to make myself stand out I bake cakes and cookie bundles and sell them online. And there are quite a lot of other similar businesses in my niche on social media. What is your advice on doing well on social media? God, I that is the question. Eh? It's a really good question. I would say you just have to start. You can't be thinking of starting. You have to just do it. And then you will work out what you like doing and what your audience likes as well i think also with baking videos i feel like there's quite a good formula that you can follow you know it'll be like today we're making sea salted caramel chocolate biscuits or something and you'll start the video with like a close-up of you breaking the cookie and it's all gooey and like hot and delicious it's always nice to have a hook then and then say you'll never guess what the secret ingredient is and i feel like with that number one you've shown the end result i'm like how do you get that that's amazing but also you're getting keeping them guessing like Oh, what is a secret ingredient? You know, is it um, ketchup or something, you know, mayonnaise? Um, so you hook them in, but then you're also creating entry. Yeah, and you're like, well, when are you going to show me, you know, the secret ingredient? But I don't think that works all the time. So I feel like showing like really, really good lighting, really good angles. Um, I was once advised to read like 
photography books or cinematography books to learn how to, you know, shoot beautifully. I think that's really important on social media. And then have maybe like a personal story about your brand or like why you started baking and, you know, what this means to you or something, something more personal. Yeah. Um, I know there's, there's a really lovely TikTok creator who does a lot of cooking and she talks about her Korean heritage and, you know, what the recipes mean to her. And, you know, her grandma, you know, made this with her when she was like a little girl or something. Right, right. And I just think it's so nice to see something, but hear like, the background of it. Um, and making it a bit more personal means you will come back to that person and continue watching it if you're intrigued by their story. But I think just starting is the most important thing. That's really good advice. She'll get feedback as she goes along. Mm. She'll see what works for her in terms of like what videos do really well, which ones yeah. do um, also face to the brand put yourself have a picture of stuff with your cookies being like here I am with my cookies because uh, if it's just a cookie photo it's just not very interesting that could, be, that could belong to anyone but I think you need to make you brand together something that we like to talk about on this podcast is this idea about how it's okay to not always have the answers to everything, mm -hmm. especially when you are starting out. In the social media world where perfection tends to be almost like a form of currency and we like to create a space on this podcast where actually we admit that sometimes we don't always have the answers to everything. Is there anything at the start of your journey, TikTok, that you had no idea about, but you know now and it's really helped you? I don't know if I need to answer that in terms of content creation i think it's more of a self-development learning who i am and being more confident in my abilities i think i've never sort of worried about being perfect on social media i mean you know i'll edit something be like ah, i like the look of that i'll throw it up but i think in general what i have learned is just really like take myself seriously and i know everyone's like oh don't take yourself seriously no no you have to take yourself seriously i don't want to be someone who's like i'm 27 and i feel like a child like i'm 27 and i'm an adult and i take myself really seriously because this is very important to me and i think what i've learned is the way that you also carry yourself and hold yourself and interact with other people can lead to greater things. I'm really interested to know about this self-development, self-awareness that you've done over time. Tell me a little bit about what was life for you back before you started working in your career. Back in the olden days. Um, I think, in so in terms of like self-development and self-awareness, I think those are like two of the most important things that you can do for yourself. I've got to a stage now where every act it sounds quite robotic but every action i do or every feeling i think or feel either like where is that coming from why are you thinking this is this helpful do other people think this this yeah. is just a you problem how are you going to react accordingly if someone annoys you you can you can react automatically like lash out and be angry at them but actually you that's not going to get you very far and also you might feel really bad afterwards but then if you don't have the self-awareness to sort of think why did i actually do that let's sit down let's have a really drill down into this this girl with the root of that insecurity that made me lash out because I was feeling insecure, then you will never solve that, I think. It really came from uh, my parents' divorce. Uh, I can laugh about it now. But I think that really rattled me. Okay. And I was hurting a lot inside and I would come out really in very negative ways. Okay. Um, I was kind of impacting people around me and it took a few people to sit me down and be like, you're being really negative. And I don't want someone like this in my life. And something like that really shook me to my core. Because I kind of recognised that I was being quite negative. But I didn't really think it was having an impact on people. Um, and when someone sits down and says, you can't do this. And it's someone who means a lot to you. That's when you're like, oh, fine, I do have to change. It's kind of like an intervention. Yeah, exactly. Or, and then it, I think that was the start of becoming more positive and more self-aware. And then I think... It really took another person saying that to me um, and sort of being like, I have to cut you out of my life because it's, you know, you're so, this just is not, you just aren't someone who I can, you know, be around at the moment. Um, so then I went to therapy for uh, like four years and that really, really helped. That was the best thing I've ever done in my life. There is naturally a part within me that is quite quite negative but I've managed to kind of 
chip away at the negativity. Every time I have a negative thought of like, no, it's not serving you. You know, obviously it's like, oh, you're feeling hungover. That's, you know, fine. But if it's, uh, you know, like a self-doubt thought or a, oh, this person probably doesn't really like me thought, it's like, that's probably not the truth. That is your negative mind trying to like take over and control. Yeah. Um, and I think it's all about changing that voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which also tells you, you can't achieve stuff. You can't do anything. And switching it to making a really positive voice. So one of my favorite phrases is, it's not you versus me. It's you, me versus the problem. And I feel like within myself, there are often two voices. One who's like, you can do this, you can do this. And the other one's like, no, you can't. And I've managed to do, it's not you versus me. I've now managed to kind of align them. And I'll be like, okay, what am I going to do about this problem? How do I positive, you know, how do I work with myself and, you know, try and get myself into a good place to like, deal with this problem rather than bashing myself? I think that's such an interesting perspective. You've clearly done a lot of work in this area and yourself. And, you know, to touch on what you're saying, I think sometimes like even negative thoughts, that can be a form of manifestation as well. Like if you negatively tell yourself something, you'll manifest not doing the thing that mm-hmm. you want to do and it will, it will happen. And I think as well, those earlier experiences you had, while they might have been challenging at the time, so your friends saying to you, I'm sorry, I need a break here, or your friends giving you that social feedback. In the end, that helped you go down this road and get yeah. that awareness. It's really sad when you like when you lose people in your life because of your own actions that's when you really have to sit down and be like no i can't do this again i can't afford to you know lose lovely people in my life because of me because of my issues but that in itself is is a positive framing because there could be a lot of instances where people think oh to hell with those people or like yeah. i'm i'm you know fine the way i am or do you know what i mean yeah. or out of a defense mechanism just not want to acknowledge it and there's no right way, wrong way of doing it. You know, everyone's on their own journey. But it's, in a way, it certainly seems to have helped you, even though you were feeling quite negative at the time. Mm. You can get so much positivity out of a negative experience if you choose to take the lessons. Okay. Um, and I think also in doing stuff, you, you kind of realise then, as you go on your positivity and your growth journey, yeah. which one of your friends are, you, you just really shouldn't be friends with them, which ones to cut out because they're just not bringing you up and being joyful or supporting you and I would say now honestly I had my house hauling the other day every single one of my friends that came it was so joyful and so just uplifting everyone got on so well and there was no there was just no negativity and it was just really nice to be around that we've had a really great conversation I think we've covered so much in this interview I'd really like people to know where can they find you on socials and where can they watch your content I'm mainly on TikTok it's HRH Queen GLD (laughs) and I think if you type in Georgiana London it also comes up it's the same on Instagram and I have attempted to start a YouTube where I'm just repurposing the TikTok content. Is your YouTube of the same name as well? Yeah, I think so. Okay, cool. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with me. Thank you.